What's up, military millionaires? Today we have an exciting episode with Nathan Cross, and him and Alex are actually friends and have done a deal together, and they talk all the time. So there's some really good advice in here about wholesaling and flipping and getting started, uh, and then understanding what is it's okay to fail and a process and doing things the right way and networking. I mean, everything we cover it all. It's just a really good episode. Nathan is an awesome dude who's about to t- retire from the army, and definitely check it out all the way to the end. There's some good advice at the end. That being said. Show notes, as always, are found at FromMilitaryToMillionaire.com slash podcast. Now relax and enjoy the show. You're listening to the Military Millionaire Podcast, a show about real estate investing for the working class. Stay tuned as we explore ways to help you improve your finances, build wealth through real estate, and become a person that is worth knowing. What's up, guys? Today, I wanted to stop and sponsor my own podcast by myself, which is a little cheesy, to tell you about the course that I'm launching called From Zero to One, Real Estate Investing for Beginners. Now, this is not a course to help you get rich fast. This is not a course to promise you to make a bajillion dollars, but this is the course that will help you get from zero rental properties to one rental property. It is designed to get you through your first purchase. Everything you need to know to get you through that step with support from myself, obviously via email and whatever, so that we can talk and I can help answer some of those questions for you. And it is extremely affordable right now because I'm launching it for only 97 bucks, which given the amount of content in there and the testimonials I got from the people who tested it beforehand, I am super on the low end for that price, but I'm going to probably have to bump it up in a little while but for now to test the waters and see exactly how many people i'm able to help with this i want it to be extremely affordable because i want to help service members and veterans get their feet in the water so if you are interested in learning about rental properties and you just want to learn how to get your first one and then there are some bonus episodes in there to help you advance past that but if you really just want to know everything you need to know to buy your first property without screwing yourself over This is the course for you. Go ahead and check it out. The link will be down below in the show notes and back to your episode. What's up, Military Millionaires? I'm your host, David Perret, here with my co-host, Alexander Felice, and our guest, Nathan Cross, who is a uh, first sergeant getting ready to retire out of the Army in Fort Bragg, and he's done a little bit of flipping, wholesaling, uh, including wholesaling one to Alex, I believe. If I'm incorrect on that, then you're both lying to me, so... uh, (laughs) Anyway, uh, Alex, um, I still haven't figured out what I'm supposed to introduce you as, so go for it. Give yourself something good. The one and only. <laughs> yeah, Alex the Hair Felice and oh, Nathan yeah, Cross. Right. <laughs> Welcome to the show, buddy. All right, thanks for having me on, man. Hi, yeah, brother. It. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, so from uh, what your intro is, yeah, I mean, I'm going to retire here. Uh, officially retire in October, so I've been in the Army now 19 plus years. Um, done a ton of deployment, ton of training. I mean, I spent the first, I, probably, I spent 11 years in uh, 160th, uh, SOAR, you know, same thing, uh, Eric Upchurch, I'm sure some of your members know him. Uh, different battalions, uh, but same kind of overall unit. Uh, I'm sure I was probably downrange with them a couple times and just didn't know it. Um, and then, you know, spent most of my time at Fort Campbell. Uh, close to Missouri, which is great for my wife because it's four hours away. So close enough, but far enough away not to have family always up in our business. Uh, then Hawaii. Uh, apparently, I think we were there at the same time. I was there from like 14 to 17 ish. Some change yep. after that. And then, and then to Fort Bragg, where I'm going to hang up these boots because it's, it's time to move on before, uh, before I'm completely burnt out and too old and too ragged to do anything else in life. Um, broken. Or broken. Yeah. Luckily, uh, luckily I've uh, survived a lot of stuff. So, um, yeah, it's, I mean, that's kind of it. I mean, for real estate stuff, I kind of, you know, fell into it at Campbell, uh, having a house. My house is kind of like a, uh, hover and hold area, if you'd like to call it, because I was a single, single dude, you know, my, uh, I had, had a son, he was there pretty often, but it was a three bedroom house and uh, kind of like house hacking before it was kind of house hacking, or at least I knew what the term was. And, you know, guys are crashing at my house, paying a few hundred bucks a month. Um, you know, they're trying to get out, out of the, they got out of the barracks or trying to save cash because I was trying to tell them 
save some money, stay with me for a little while, you know, let that BAH kind of kick in. Um, or guys, uh, worst case scenario, guys were getting a divorce and so they needed a, a place to crash, lay low for a little while, you know, either on the cheap or, or not at all. Cause I was in that same situation as them, but luckily I was, I had a house, so I didn't have to hide out anywhere or bunker down. I just went to my own house. Um, you know, and I just want to make sure of, that we all know that buying a house is not a good risk mitigator against divorce. <laughs> no, because unless you buy it prior to your, to your marriage, you're safe. Well, and that even depends so, on the state. Got to get that a prenup. You know what I mean? Don't buy a house just in case you get divorced. I need a <laughs> So, yeah. And then, um, kind of was just like that. The guys were kind of crashing and saving money. Um, and then. You know, just squirrel away a bunch of stuff. We had a couple of houses before because I lived at Campbell for so long and sold all those and was too scared to do any real estate investing in Hawaii just because of the, the prices. And I was very naive and I didn't do a lot of reading. Right? you know, didn't immerse myself in that. I immersed myself in the stock market because I figured, hey, you know what? I can do this, you know, via computer. But that's pretty much what I did. Pretty much what I did the whole time I was in Hawaii was kind of invest in stocks, you know. Uh, and then when I got back to to the mainland and here at North, uh, you know, Fayetteville, uh, North Carolina, I just decided that, that screw it, let's just take our money and try to build as much uh, back into the war chest as possible. So started flipping um, some houses here, which is okay, but you know, flipping is flipping is flipping. You know, it's it's a quick buck. It's not uh, you know really building true true wealth and you don't really have a, a real asset. You're just trying to squeeze the juice out of that thing as much as possible. Um, but if you use that money for something else, you know, like buying rentals or investing in another business or something, I think it's, it's better off, you know, it's really, yeah, I, think it's important to, I think it's important to talk about the distinction or at least notice the distinction. People, uh, what you said is correct. Flips won't build you wealth. Um, it's like, it's a, it's a, it's any, it's just like any inventory based business that you're selling, you know, Hey, I got to sell, you know, iPhones, I got to sell 10,000 of them to make any money. Well, flips, you have one piece of inventory, but it's the same type of business. It's not a wealth creating business. No, 100%. You know what I mean? But I, I knew coming in like, Hey, I'm not going to stay here in, in Fayetteville. Right. I need to do something to put my money to work. Um, you know, exercise me running a, a, a running a business. You know, being legit as possible. Um, you know, getting in the reps. Like I always say, like, hey, you got to do X, Y, and Z. Get in these reps before you know it, it's it's for real. So, you know, started the business, created an LLC. Yeah, you know, people were like, why would you create an LLC? And I'm like, oh, I did it for me. I didn't care what anybody said. I wanted to be as legit as possible. I wanted to see the cost. I wanted to, you know, keep the you know, the business cost coming in so I can analyze how much it's going to cost to do, to do a business like this. Right. So I did that first flip like anywhere else when you move in, you don't know anybody. Right. I didn't want to ask anybody for any money, no family, no friends. So I just pulled the trigger and did it on my own, which was of course a learning experience everywhere you go. Right. Fired a lot of people revamped my contracts that I had for Tennessee for North Carolina, because there were some things that were different. Um, you know, I, lost like 500 or 700 dollars in my first deal here which is which is good because you know i've heard horror stories where people lose their ass and they're just trying to break even but you know my wife's like okay it didn't really work out that well what are you going to do now i'm like oh yeah i'm going to buy this i'll buy another house and she was just like seriously i was like well you know me i'm hard-headed right this is something i want to do got to work out the kinks you know let this shit buff out um and, and then just keep it rolling you know the second house i bought here was the last house I actually bought on the MLS since I've been here. They wanted like forty-five thousand dollars for it, but the house had been sitting on the market for like two years. And long story short, we negotiated it down. You know, got inspections. You know, sent the realtor the inspections. Like, listen, you know, these are the problems that are wrong. I'm not going to pay this. I'll pay this price. Negotiated it down. I pretty much ended up buying a house for about seventeen grand after closing costs. And then flipped it for 110. So, how long, how long did that one take you? Uh, four months because of uh, the city of Fayetteville, because of the, the inspections. Had to get that uh, certificate of occupation. That was the first house 
um, here that I learned that the certificate of occupation um, is a good thing to have if you can get it, right? So the building inspector was really, really hard up because the lot next door to it is flooded and closed out. So there was a portion in the back, like a sliver that the state of North Carolina considered a flood zone. So that was kind of another issue that I was having to to try to work with the city. You're like, listen, it's like literally a piece of the property that's not, you know, you're you're looking at less than, you know, a third of the property and then the back end that's considered a flood zone. So but it took four months from purchase from acquisition to rehab to on the market um, to sell. So it was, it was all right. It was pretty good. Um, there's no complaints other than the city, but that's where I learned where, like today I'm going to go down to the, to the uh, permit office and get the COA for this current flip that's done. They'd already passed um, inspections the other day from the city. So I'm just going to get the certificate, scan it, send it to my uh, real estate agent so she can give it as, as part of her advertisement because, you know, it's a rehab house. Um, it's that time, you know, that, you know, I'm sure most of your guys have read. It's like everyone, you know, who has a, has a hammer and a truck can be a contractor. So there's a bunch of houses around here getting flipped and um, shoddy work is being everywhere else. So it's kind of like one of those things that I like to do is like, hey, here's a COA. Give it to potential buyers. Like it's been inspected by the city. Right. So, you know, everything's been, you know, I's are dotted, T's are crossed. Shouldn't be no issues with the rehab. So it's just kind of like one of those things that I, I like to give when I know the city building inspector is going to come and inspect and give us the, the thumbs up. I just get it and I send it to my realtor. So it's like the difference between being really smart and being really smart, but having a degree on your wall. Pretty much. I guess you can look, you can look smart. You, you got a bunch of fancy stuff behind you, but don't mean you are smart. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, it's just one of those things, you know, like, Alex has been over to my flip. Of course, you know, everyone knows that Alex, he's going he's gonna to bust your balls regardless if you over, if you over uh, rehab, you under rehab, he's just going to give you shit because he just loves it. You know what I'm saying? He just, it's, he feeds off of it. You know what I mean? And, and it's good, right? But then, there, you know, if you don't really know Alex, there's about a five minute thing where he kind of gets to really Alex and he's like, no, you did a great job. You know, I probably wouldn't have done this, this, and this. And these are the reason why. And then it's like, lights are back on now. It's Alex yeah, Felice. That peacock. part's never recorded. No, it's not. That's 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 the thing. So I let all your viewers know, like, hey, you know, you'll see the you'll see two sides of Alex extreme, right? You got to get him where there's those five minutes where he's like legit and he's like, hey, yeah, you know, this is good, this is good. Why'd you do this? He'll ask like really questions to to build his build his knowledge base on things, right? You know, and then and then he he goes back to the uh, to Alex, to Alex Felice. We all know and love or hate depending on what side of the fence you're on. So you did, um, you did improve this property a bit though, yeah? I 100% over improved this property. You are correct. Okay, but, um, but, but hang on, before, before I get to being mean, let me ask you a, <laughs> let me ask you a legitimate question. Because um, you know, I almost over improved my recent flip and maybe I over improved it in some ways, but you know, there's not a, there's not a fine line between over improvement and correct improvement, right? It's it's a long, it's a long, a wide gray line between where's the over improvement and where and where it's not because you don't know the buyer's willing to pay. Really, not when you're in it. Like it can look, it's easy from the outside, but when you're in it, you're like, what should I do with these cabinets? I have to make the decision. What's going to sell the best and still be cost effective? And it's not usually like, oh, I'll pay an extra fifty bucks. You know, it's like, well, I either got to replace the cabinets and spend three or I can paint them and pay 1200, right? It's a big gap and I, I don't know. So, so I say all that to say, okay, we agree that you over improved that property, which um, now being, that being said, it looks really nice, right? It looks incredible. Thank um, you. And you did some work that maybe other people wouldn't have done that I, I'm actually, I think is impressive, maybe didn't need to be done, but I know why you did it. So in Nate's house, there's, it was what three bedrooms upstairs and it was a garage the previous owners converted the garage into like a living space but and they do that a lot in, in our town and they kind of half-assed it ha or you know they three quarters asked it and then nate comes along and says no 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 we're going to really box that up and we're going to turn it into the master living suite put plumbing and a stand-up shower in there and it looks fantastic but was it necessary uh so like you said like you said there's that gray right it was it was one of those things 
it was already converted. Probably not. But again, it's about like, for me, it was like getting in the reps. Like when people say you're over improving, I'm like, yeah, I might be over improving, but at the end of the day, I'm trying to build a, a brand, a business, right? Cause I'm not going to live here forever. Right. I'd like to branch out and say, Hey, look, here's what I've done in this area. Yeah. It might've been over improvement, but if I can take this type of attention to detail, quality, you know, my wife's outside the box design thinking, how making things work, we can do that. We can replicate that in an area probably, you know, where the margins are greater or are expecting that type of work. Yes, we know. I know that the numbers are going to be a little bit higher for material and labor costs and stuff like that. But if I, if I can exercise that, you know, that art and that execution of something in Fayetteville, not saying Fayetteville is like a dump, but it's, you know, it's Fayetteville. It's just like any army or any military town, right? Um, they're going to buy a house based off your, their, v, their VA, right? And a really good test is around military people because, you know, there's a good percentage, about 90%, you know, like they're young, they're bougie, they want the nice thing, they want the shiny thing, so give it to them, right? The, the neighborhoods aren't like you see on TV, but uh, if you can turn a good product and you know it's going to 90% of the time is going to go to another service member, right? Just, just do a good thing. You know what I mean? You may not make as much money. Your margins are not there, but I'm still making money, right? I'm still making money. I'm getting practice. I'm getting the reps in of doing doing this. So at the end of the day, I think it's the long game, right? I'm going to do this. I'm going to do stuff like this. So I might as well get the practice. I'm doing it the right way the first time. Deal with contractors. Deal with the city. Learn permanent codes. All that kind of stuff now, right? So that later on down the road, I'm a little bit more well versed in it. So that's that's the way I look at it. It's all the long game. Everything I'm doing is for the long game. No, I don't care if I don't make thirty thousand dollars a rip. You know, it's okay. It's fine. You know what I mean? Quality of work is what matters to me. You do seem like you try to convince yourself pretty hard, but I feel you. <laughs> convince myself. Well, you, you know, you heard me say it, man. Nobody's gonna believe in your hype until you believe it. So, I, I'll believe yeah. in my hype. All day. I'll believe in my hype all day. I'll be my biggest cheerleader next to my wife. You know what I mean? But, you know, I got little Nate in my truck at all at all times. You know what I'm saying? So he's he's my biggest critic. You know, the little bobblehead doll that sometimes shows up on my Instagram feed. You know, with a dis the disheartening hard face because he's always angry. Um, so you know what I mean? It's just one of those things. I got I to gotta believe in what I'm doing before anybody else does. I like that. It seems like how Alex lives his life. I don't oh, yeah. believe in myself at all. I'm astounded you guys all believe my nonsense. <laughs> That's, what gives me, That's what gives me energy. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, uh, so, Nate, the, the, you said in the beginning when you first started, you, um, you lost a little bit of money. And yeah. now you're going to make some good money. So... Yeah. Kind of tell us what are some of the lessons you learned between that first and this one that is it just the deal? Is it the market different? Is it the way you approach contractors? Like, can you give us some specifics on like on process changes that you know made it a difference? So it's always going to be the contractor that you have in your corner or contractors, right? Um, it's always going to be that way. They're the ones that are kind of, you know, you have to fire and forget like you, you know, contractors are, are, are always going to be the, the hinge pin because if you have a great deal and they piss away any margins because of, of errors on their work or their, their guy's work, you're just, you're paying double the cost, right? Um, I always tell people if you're going to flip, this is just me, I get an inspection, right? And I, and I never go in there blind. I use the inspection twofold. One, to make sure that I can estimate the cost of rehab, right? And then I use it as a negotiation tool. I even do it for all the other deals I find I find off market, you know, right? Because like I said, my second second buy here in Fayetteville was the last deal I bought on the MLS. Everything I've the other uh, four four properties, five properties, I all found off market, right? And I'm very transparent with the with the with the sellers. Like I send them the inspection report so they know I'm not you know full of shit and lying to them about stuff. And I and I say, hey, please reference these pages. These are the issues that I'm having at paying this price. Right. And then I'm like, listen, I'd like to buy the property because it's either one sitting vacant or two you need to move. I said, we just have to come to an agreeable price. And then we close on them if they agree to the price that I give them. Um, but yes, and contractors, inspections. You're saying, 
What's that? So you're saying make sure you get good contractors in your team. Yep. And make sure you negotiate the price a little bit more. Well, yeah, know. I mean, but negotiate it with based off knowledge, with based off facts, not just because, oh, I need to get it done at this price. You know what I'm saying? Negotiate it based, at, you know, on good, good faith, transparency. So I send them the report. I don't want them, I don't want them to think like, you know, some random dude that called me two weeks ago, got my number off the public records, right, or off some server, or off some platform, is, is, a, is, a, is a swindler, a con artist, right? If I give them the report, they can see it, um, you know, I'm just trying to do it on good faith because I think down the road, I mean, karma's a bitch. It's going to catch up with you, right? You can do business uh, in a shady way, right? You can tiptoe the gray or you can try at least not, not, not uh, run your life that way. So I send them the report. I'm like, here you go. This is a report. This is what this is what the problem is. I need I need you to come off X amount of dollars so we can make this deal happen. And that's it. And it works too because as soon as you uh, gave up on flipping, you became a wholesaler and got me a deal. I had, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I had that deal. But yes, I did. You needed a deal. I wanted to help out old Alex Felice. You know, bigger than life uh, on bigger pockets. Uh, so yeah, you got, you got your first flip. You're welcome. And then you talk shit the whole time you had it. I am going to sell it before you sell yours too. Can you believe that? I, I can't. Uh, I can, I can believe it because you didn't have to transfer uh, um, my house. Yeah. You had to transfer your house. You also, well, like you said about contractors, you know, that my, ah. my partner is ridiculous. Um, he is. but, he but is I want to, uh, there's an actual point I wanted to make in there in that, you know, a lot of people, um, focus on say one of the three sides of real estate acquisitions, uh, rehab and management or sales on the back end, the retail side. So if you're flipping, you kind of are focused on the rehab side and the retail sell side, but not the deal flow side. So, and that's my problem too. I buy houses. Um, I either property manage them or now, you know, we sell them. Um, but the deal acquisition side, I haven't really focused on. And that's kind of, I find it interesting that that's what you pivoted to first. As soon as you're like, man, these deals are just, you know, getting them from wholesalers. It's hit or miss on its best day. And so instead what Nate Cross is going to do is he's going to, um, he's going to buy some wholesaling software and some templates and he's going to start blasting people in these lists um, himself to try to generate his own leads. So how did you decide? Most people don't do that. I've been in this business for a little while. Most people team up with a sailor or, or, you know, some other mechanism to get them deal, to get them deal flow. But you said, I'm going to create my own. How'd that decision? Oh man, I don't know. Maybe it's just me. I'm hard headed or military brainwashing, but, uh, I, I do realtors bless their hearts, right? I got it. They got to make a living, but they're not good at finding deals. And the only way to get good at something is doing it yourself. Right? So, I know what I'm looking for. I know what I what the margins need to be at. I know the, the neighborhoods pretty well. So I just started, you know, looking looking for deals. I, you know, did I did mailers, you know, uh we skip traced, you know, my previous partner that we were working on some deals, you know, he skip traced some stuff using prop stream and stuff like that. And then I don't know, uh, about October to August, yeah, it was about October last year. Somebody called me off one of the uh, off one of the flyers, you know what I mean, that I had mailed out a long time ago, and wanted me to buy their property, you know. So it's kind of, and I was like, well, I don't have the cash to buy it, but this guy wants me to buy it. He wants it done. So I was like, well, there's a couple of investors, you know, that have reached out to me. So I just kind of, you know, hit him up, sent him some pictures, sent him some, you know, numbers of, you know, some some data for them to kind of make a decision if this is going to work or not, you know. Again, because I look at the deal, whether I'm going to buy it or not, is what is it going to take for me to buy the deal? What are the numbers going to look like? Again, it's getting in the reps, it's practice, it's analyzing the deals, right? And then they bought, he bought. I didn't have to do anything, right? And again, I didn't mark it up like a lot of traditional wholesalers are doing. And then plus this guy knew that I was flipping in Fayetteville. So my numbers, my rehab costs, right? My projections were pretty close, right? May not have been perfect because he's got his own contracting crew that has done all his flips for him. So I know his numbers are probably a little bit on the cheaper side, but I try to get my numbers to be very conservative, right? Because at the end of the day, I look at it as, okay, I can make the numbers work where I can still make a little bit of money. The investor makes money, right? Everyone's happy. Everyone gets paid. 
and it builds kind of a, a customer based relationship. You know, you can do repeat business with people, right? Because at the end of the, at the end of the day, that's, that's all that matters. Um, so that kind of like struck the light bulb, like everyone says in your head, like, oh shit. So I've been in Fayetteville now a year and a half flipping houses. How many deals did I pass up on that I could have made, you know, a few thousand bucks? Cause again, not marking it up 10, 12, you know, 13, $15,000, like a lot of wholesalers around here do, right? No, 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 nothing against them. You know, it's like Alex told me the first time I met him, you ask for all the money all the time. So I guess that's what they're doing, waiting for somebody to tell them no. Um, but I just was like, well, you know, if they're good investors, they're good. Another numbers are skewed. They're not going to, they're not going to call, call back or not hit, ask me if I got any properties. Cause that's pretty much what I did to every wholesaler that sent me a deal where their numbers were off. Yeah. I, just I think took them out. I think there's a definite balance there because yes, you, you always want to ask a price, right? Like it's, it's like saying, you know, you don't put your own price on your head for like speaking, let people tell you, you know, like don't, don't limit yourself. But at the same time, I agree. There's a couple contract or a couple wholesalers in, in the area that I work in that have sent me deals before. And I'm like, you know, I ask them like, is this really what you think? Or is this like your, you know, whatever. And if they're like stuck on it, I'm like, yep, I'm not like, and if it's like, you know, if it's one time, okay, whatever. But if they send me two or three deals where the numbers are, you know, legitimately, I can look at it and not do an analysis and know, wow, that's terribly off. Like not even close. You're trying to sell me. Um, then I just, I just unsubscribe from their email list. Cause I'm like, it's not even worth seeing this stuff. Um, and I, and in fact, there's actually a entire like agency down here and I'm not going to name them, but like a real estate agency down here that uh, they kind of try to, focus on, you know, like San Diego market, helping people wholesale, they, they help you find good deals and squeeze plays and whatever. And they sent me a couple things and I was, I was asking people around and yeah, that's, it's very obviously like super high markup, super, super, super aggressive ARV. And you're like, not even, not even a chance, man. Like, are you, it does your renovation not mention that it includes adding three bedrooms and another bathroom and like 2000 more square feet to this house or what's, what am I missing here? Are we buying the patch of land next to it? Like what's, you know, so it's, yeah. So I think there's, there's definitely a line there, right? Like you don't want to undersell yourself by any means and you do want to ask for what you're worth, but at the, point of still being transparent enough that people will do business with you because the guys who will do the guys who will spot that not to say that i'm one of those guys but like the guys who will spot that like that are the guys that will do multiple deals with you if you're good like alex will call you on your shit and then you'll never work with him again if he's if he's like well this guy's full of crap yeah Yeah, there's a a wholesaler who made recently made so much money on me that i decided i'm gonna pay somebody to to do wholesaling Full time. Yeah. <laughs> because Which, so now he's got a competitor and he lost. It. Yeah. So it's like, now, hey, yeah, so it's hey, look, you can make a little, you can make a little bit of money on me and, and we can all go full happy and I'll buy a bunch of deals or you make so much money on me on one deal that I just decide that I'll, I'll compete with you and I will. Competition, competition's good, right? It'll breed out the week. Right. But I noticed like, you know, the, the deals, the deals are, are always, Always hit or miss, you know what I mean? I had a, I had a good couple couple weeks run um, uh, recently, you know, it kind of like took a, took a few months of reconnecting with people, you know, trying to stay up and do, the follow-up is key for acquisition, right? I'm sure I'm not the first person to say it, I'm sure I won't be the last person to say it, but like acquisition, uh, you've got to follow up. I know Alex, he, he thinks that my method is very crude because I don't use like a platform base, I'm old school, right? I got a book. Got a bunch of little yellow tablets on there, right? Little sticky notes. Um, and then that's I just call cool. them. It is crude, but guess what? That's just, that's just me, right? It's, it's the way I roll. Uh, you know, transference. I write some information down. You know, hopefully it goes somewhere in the back of my brain and I'll, it'll click back up. But a lot of the follow up, a lot of things that follow up, right? Is going and, and following up and just kind of, you know, building some type of rapport with them. Any, any type of rapport, you know what I mean? Just like maybe, yesterday, I got, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, maybe you could turn your crude method into like a compromise. So before we went on the uh, Marine Corps recruiting system, the new computer system that automated all the CRM and everything, they had pack cards. And what they had was they had little, just like note cards, right? Like index cards. They had, obviously they had like lines on them. You filled them out, but you could do essentially instead of writing in your journal, 
you could do index cards and you could just have like a file folder that says January, February, March, April, whatever. And then you just stick it in the month that you're supposed to follow up with them. So that'd be a way to somewhat automate what you're already doing. So you still get the benefit of writing it down. You still get it yeah. on your journal or whatever, but then you stick it in the month you're supposed to follow up. And then at the beginning of that month, you pull it out and you're like, oh, let me follow up with this guy. Because you're going to, although I agree handwriting is great, I also agree that you're going to miss people. Yeah, I probably am missing people for sure. Um, yeah, being wow. proud of being old school in the tech age. Oh, here we go. Is <laughs> I'm just saying, it, I mean, somebody had somebody had some technical world first world problem this morning. You know what I mean? Sometimes technology is. I still drive a horse to work because I'm old school. <laughs> 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 Listen, no, no one's going back on the prairie, Alex. All right. Well, Mom, I love my point is when, when's the correct way to use a phone? I send letters only because I'm old school. When does the when does it just become? Hey, look, Nate, you just haven't taken the time to to build a habit of putting your notes in digitally somewhere. When does it become yeah. Nate's fault? You didn't know you were getting in the hot seat on this podcast. Well, I mean, so it does. So I actually use a VA, right? to do um, some of the text messaging stuff on a platform, right? And guess what I did? I, I set up a Google Google page for him, like, you know, a little drop the folder. He he updated all this stuff and he, he put anything that showed up as a lead for me to follow up, it went there. But then I reverted back to the to the book, right? So yeah, I use technology, just can't help it. You know, just go back to that book because I can take that book with me everywhere. I don't have to stop, get some, get a Wi-Fi signal or hook up to, you know, hook up to my cell phone. You know, there are some benefits. Yes, very crude, very rudimentary. But right now I'm a, a one man band uh, out here just trying to trying to get as many deals as possible, even though like, you know, this will probably be the last the flip that I'm on right now, will probably be my last flip in Fayetteville due to the simple fact that I'm going to move to uh, the St. Louis area. Um, so I've been really focused on on acquisitions, finding deals for guys like Alex and Alex's team and um, a couple other investors that have reached out to me personally that want to invest in Fayetteville. So, I mean, I might as well make a little bit of money uh, to oh. rebuild that war chest. So. You can get one of those tablets they have now where it's a tablet, but you write on it and then it takes your handwriting, turns it into print, like type, and it uploads oh, yeah. it. I got, the, I got the version one down from that, right? Because, I, you know what I mean? I'm, a, I'm bootstrapping it. I say all this. I'm a handwriter too a lot of times, but, you know, for like action, but for actionable things, I don't use it for like follow ups or stuff that I'm going to want to type or whatever. I use that for like, I don't know, like outlines so, or like laying so thoughts know, on paper. I, when I'm like outlining something or laying thoughts out, I, I often prefer to handwrite, but not if it's something that I'm going to like, not if I'm outlining like a blog post where I'm going to end up writing it anyway. Yeah. Google, well, like I said, Google, there, there, there are some stuff. I yeah. Google do. Keep is awesome. Google hey, um, Nate, you mentioned St. Louis, and I want to take this moment, I want to take that as a segue to uh, talk to David and I to talk about the thing in St. Louis. Oh, yes. Good, Good job. point. I like, look at that. What a great co-host or host of this episode. I might as well be the co-host today. Alex, is, <laughs> Alex knows the guest and he's running with it. But I'm happy uh, to have you on my show. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so for those of you listening who haven't heard yet, it, May 29th and 30th in St. Louis, we're doing Veterans REI Live, which is the first ever military real estate investor conference. It's going to be kind of like a, you can think of it as like a job fair. We're going to have speakers from every niche, from personal finance to large multifamily syndications, networking, birth strategy, fix and flip. I mean, everything, right? And all the guys that are going to be speaking or girls are are top notch. I mean, we've got uh, like, for example, finance is Doug Nordman, which is the military guy. And if you don't know anything about military finance, like he's the guy. He retired 17 years ago in Hawaii and has tur taught surfing for free for since then. Uh, multifamily syndication, we have some very, very, very large people involved. Um, I mean, Alex is speaking. I don't know why I'm speaking, but I am. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but it, it, Bill Allen, the guy putting it on, you know, the uh, behind it, and the guys made millions flipping houses and wholesaling deals. So very legitimate crew of people. And we're going to be, it's going to be all nonprofit. I mean, I paid for my own ticket to go to an event that I'm helping to host, which is probably unheard of in the conference world. But uh, the point is to, you know, do nonprofit and help pay for 
uh, help donate to charities, but really the point is to help you guys get involved in real estate investing. So if you're interested in learning, this is the place to go. St. Louis, May 29th, 30th. Yeah, everything he said, I agree with. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're going to be there to, to talk. Got it. He is. He is. We're yeah. going to be roomies. I already bought our room. Uh -huh. Look at that. Hopefully it's more than one bed this time, right? The, yeah, I bought two this time because my wife might come one night. So that way she has a room, a bed while Alex and I snuggle. Let's get good. For those people who don't know, David and I shared a room at which wait, wait we stayed together at BPCon and FinCon, right? Yeah, but BPCon was the one you booked the room on. I booked the room and I only got one bed. <laughs> and I thought, I'm curious, right? Because this is a military podcast. So all my military people. I'm don't act like it was planned. You didn't mean to. It was the morning of, you're like, no, <laughs> <laughs> she's like hey we're in this bed i get in there there's one bed right and i was like well i could i don't complain. care whatever that's how i was i was like eh? we i threw, didn't think I don't twice even, about it i think i think the first night we threw a pillow in the middle and i think after that it was like whatever come and go you guys in, i don't guys in rochambeau rochambeau for big spoon <laughs> and so i'm curious i'm curious for any anybody listening to this podcast if they would be deter military people that's why i was like whatever like me and David or both in the military, like sharing a nice bed in a hotel room with a dude is still like one of the least gay things that I did compared to all the stuff I did in the, all the sleeping arrangements we have in the army. <laughs> I don't know. I didn't think that much of it, but no. apparently it's, big. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's funny to joke about because it was like, you know, intentional, but like whatever, man. I also have some boot. Can I self plug? I have some boudoir photos of David on my blog at mm. the choice. Of the BP oh, we, I think I've seen them posted a couple different places. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> hey, dad, let's play with the new camera. I uh, know, right? Hot. There we go. Today's show is brought to you by Audible. Audible is offering our listeners a free audiobook with a 30 day trial membership. Just go to audibletrial.com slash military millionaire. Now, why Audible? Audible content includes an unmatched selection of audiobooks, original audio shows, news, comedy, and more from the leading audiobook publishers, broadcasters, and entertainers. I listen to Audible every single day on my commute to and from work. Now, to download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash military millionaire. Oh man. All right. Hey, so Nathan, all right. So you mentioned prop stream and I think you, do you use lead Sherpa? I do. I, so I how, get on lead Sherpa. Can you kind of walk through real quick, just a quick overview of what some of those look like for finding deals? Uh, I mean, so I use two platforms, right? I use prop stream to kind of aggregate the data. Uh, you can, you can really niche to what you're looking for based off bedrooms, lot size, stuff like that. ARV, you know, all, you can you can really whittle down the list of what you what you pull from PopStream, right? So I take the data that I'm looking for from PopStream, I put it in Lead Sherpa's little file folder Excel, right? And then I drop that into Lead Sherpa, and then I pay the cost of skip tracing plus the membership to text out. So Lead Sherpa is supposed to be able to you know be in compliance with FCC regulations and all that stuff to to text people. So I can literally sit. Um, on a, but the, the problem is somebody has to physically be on the platform to engage with people unless they call the phone number that text them, which routes it to my business cell phone, right? Um, so I do that. So I, like all week, you know, I've probably sent out an average of 350 texts, right? And maybe, you know, a 310 actually make it to the, to the individual. And then it's, it's hit or miss on, uh, on response. I think it's a little bit more efficient, right? Uh, again, my opinion, right? Because I'm in the army, I'm going to school, like trying to get my PMP, trying to do my real estate uh, license for, for Missouri. So like, I just like, okay, this is the fastest, easiest way for me to kind of send out as many text messages, right? Big, big funnel system in a way and get some, get some responses either. You know, I've had people go tell me, you know, fuck you and all sorts of other worse shit, right? But um, and, and then you can just go ahead and click do not do not call because there's a there's a feature on there If they tell you don't call me. I'm not interested, right? You click the do not call there's a priority There's a qualified lead button right in these numbers and then once you go through um, Everything that you skip trace right you can click on it again and create the same campaign over again And it takes everything out that you either put on do not call 
right? It just deletes them all out of the campaign and then you can restart all over again. So like every month, I, I, every month I pull an aggregated list for Fayetteville, Hope Mills, Stanford, um, you know, every, every area where I think, you know, I can find um, a flip for someone or I can find somebody looking for rentals, you know, to be able to, to, to wholesale it to them, you know what I'm saying? Stuff like that. So I probably have about 5,000. If I reset all my campaigns, I probably have about 5,000 contacts or availability to text people. And I run through those lists like every week, you know, because some people don't get it. Some people don't answer it. I, I text them, they just look at it and they just, you know, don't say anything. And then I hit them up a week or 10 days later again. So it's kind of repeat. Numbers, numbers, that, numbers. It is. So, awesome. Yeah. I mean, you just got to continuously, continuously, like kind of, kind of follow up on them. You know, there's, you know, one guy I've been talking to since November. Last week I went to go look at his house. He said he was going to be there to show it to me. He never showed up. Right. I've been to, I've been to this house twice already. Right. I wanted to go through it again because he said he was having work done to it, which nothing has been done to it. And he didn't show up. So he had me there for like an hour waiting on it because I know this lead, right. It's, I'm going to be able to get it at a deep enough discount, whether it needs 30 or $35,000 worth of rehab work, but it's definitely not a flip. It's a rental all day long. Right. So I know being persistent with this guy, you know, kind of working around his schedule that myself and another investor, right? And RJ, everyone will be able to make money in this deal. But I just got to stay kind of persistent with this guy beyond his schedule, you know, but that's the, that's the only thing when you're out there looking for deals. And I think that's probably like the biggest, the biggest issue, not really issue, maybe problem or lack of time is that, you know, people don't always have enough time to look for deals. So they kind of want somebody else to do it, which is fine. I get it. But people have to understand you're going to pay for, you're going to pay for that deal at a premium, right? But again, don't be a greedy, greedy person. The numbers have to work for everybody, right? Transparency. Like, hey, this is what the average ARV are because I use Offstream and it, 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 and it um, prints out a C, uh, CMA, right? And then I just don't use that CMA. I do, but then I, I verify that the data I'm getting from the CMA by the addresses, I get on Zillow, I look at, you know, is this really like a, a comparable, right? Cause it just blankets the neighborhood. You know, what year is the house built? You know, how old is the house? One car, two car garages, I have this and have that, you know, you got to start looking at the data that you're given and then I highlight everything. Like, okay, this is good, this is good, this is good. And then that's what I use when I, when I try to present the deal. You know what I mean? Like, okay, but then I always go look at the deal first and figure out is this going to be a flip or is this going to be a rental, right? And then it just depends on what the deal is, where the, where the numbers are at, you know, who who I need to call. You know, I'll call, you know, Alex's guy, RJ, be like, hey, listen, I think this is a great deal. Come check it out. I send him pictures first. It works on his schedule. If he can come look at it in another later date, and then he comes and looks at it. And I try, I, you know, most of the time I already have it under contract. Easy. Eh, easy-ish, but yes, easy as, as Alex would Simple. say. Simple. No, that's good. And I'm actually sad you're going to leave because, you know. You made him money. More deals. <laughs> yeah, you made me money. Well, I mean, like I said, I'll be, I'll be in another market, right? You can't just not invest in Fayetteville. Fayetteville is, is great. But I think, you know, the market I'm going to is going to be as relatively comparable-ish to Fayetteville. I mean, I've already been looking. The last couple of years. Like, fail without those that, that was like the most generic sentence I've ever heard. It's so military. <laughs> As relatively <laughs> generic. Yes. Yeah. Very descriptive. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Was it was yeah, it orientated towards the uh systematized? What's the other word that they all anyway? <laughs> oh, they'll say, well, we'll behoove you to behoove There we go. I used that yesterday in a brief and I like because I couldn't think of a better word and I almost slapped myself. Like it just came yeah. out and I was like, I stopped. I literally like I said it and I just stopped. It was like, ah, and then finished my sentence. Yeah. Hopefully it'll, it'll take a few months for the, uh, the, the, uh, the government brainwashing to wash out, but I, I'm sure there'll be times where I'll have Tourette's where I'll, it'll come back out. So Tourette's. Yes. And that's what I call it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's pretty much about it. So don't know what other questions, uh, 
you or Alex have for me that I'd love to answer. Because since you guys so, are the first time on the podcast, pop the cherry, so, you know what I mean? This is your first podcast? Oh, yeah. Pop the cherry. The biggest military podcast on recording right now? I don't know. On recording? <laughs> yeah, I could hey, You'd be nothing without me, you know that? You're so welcome. I mean, I'm really uh, awesome to be on the show. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I appreciate but, that. I mean, only because you introduced me to him, so. Actually, it all, actually, it all it's out. Like we should have Nate Cross on. I said, nah, I know that guy. He's not good. <laughs> it was. Well, like I said, as soon as, as, soon as I, I logged into Zoom and then everything started happening, I seen, oh, Dave Pre. Nope. This face said, I see Alex. I went, motherfucker. This is great. Oh, yeah. I didn't even tell you. That. Did I even tell you that he was going to co host? No, nah, of course not. I know that you told me one time. I haven't, like, oh, I haven't been warning co-host. people. No, it's I, good. I'm like I, afraid it's, they're not going to show up. Like, uh, there's, oh, a good, there's a good possibility. Oh, oh, wait. I'll have to answer real questions instead of just talk about myself? Shit. <laughs> I mean, I'm not that bad. No, you're not. I know. And Nate knows me. So. For, for, well, that's why yeah. I didn't even mention it. And then I told Scott Trench you were going to be co host. And. Uh, although, hey, I'll have to edit this out now because I started saying it. So <laughs> I was going to tell you that we may not do Wednesday night because he realized how late it was his night and we'll have to reschedule. But um, so editor, yeah. please take that part out. <laughs> yeah. No, but yeah, I mean, it's it's good. Alex, uh, like I said, you know, when I met Alex is just like probably anybody else has ever met him. Just you kind of emailed some questions or he saw you post something in bigger pockets and he responded of course he leads with which i always see that he leads with his episode on bigger pockets check out this episode was it like 314 or whatever the number is and he's like you know and then he kind of corresponds with you right and then it was kind of that and then i saw that he was in fayetteville i messaged him like he posted on social media i made a comment and uh he messaged me back and then he was just like hey you know kind of like what are you doing i was like well i'm working at this flip I got going on right now. He's like, well, can I come by? I'm like, yeah, sure. Literally showed up with RJ um, the next day, kind of looked at some stuff out, you know, kind of seeing what I was doing. I could tell RJ was really like looking at the, how I was like doing the split because he was like, so are you doing all this X, Y, and Z? And I was like, yep, you know, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. This is why I'm doing it. You know, he was really analyzing all my answers while Alex was kind of doing what Alex does, you know, doing his hair, kind of ask, you know, like looking at stuff, you know, uh, you know, he was, being the, the uh, arm candy for RJ. Um, and that's kind of how, that's kind of how we kind of all aligned. I know, you know, I met RJ once. He kind of, I joke with him, like he kind of Heisman me, right? Cause he was busy at this like little thing, you know, which is fine. It, it is what it is, but persistence. And then I guess proof of concept, right? He saw it. He kind of went to look at the project and saw what I was doing, what I got the project for, like what I got the deal for, how I found the deal. I told him. So, um, you know, it kind of worked out. And then, you know, I found uh, Alex and Rod's investors a couple of deals, including Rod's uh, uncle, right? A, g- a good uh, rental deal. And it's been, it's been like that ever since. They're like, hey, can you? So, you know, I, d- I find a deal, you know, it kind of sucks for, you know, they're, they're going to see the deals or they're going to hear about the deals first. But then we blanket it out to everyone. You know what I mean? Whoever, who's ever in the stable of investors, like, here you go. Here's your shot. You take it or leave it. And, that's usually it, you know what I mean? Yeah, this is interesting. Um, there's an interesting dynamic here because what happens is new people, they come in and they say, they're gonna hear this and be like, man, I need to find Alex in my town or I need to find Roderick in my town. And that's partially correct. But like you said, you had met Roderick maybe a year ago or eight months ago or something like that. And yeah. um, so twofold, one, you should 100% be networking online because you just don't know who you're gonna meet. You really, me and David met online. No, we didn't. We didn't at FinCon. We met because um, I was at a real estate meetup at FinCon and we got kicked out of the pool for drinking Corona. So then we smuggled all the Corona into the award ceremony and got drunk. That sounds like some place that you'd meet. If that was happening, I'd be there for sure. That's exactly what we did. (laughs) No, but okay. But but Nate and I met meet online and Roger and I met six years ago. And so all I'm saying is like, Nate met Roderick and Roderick meets a ton of new investors and he doesn't do, he's not the, he's got a business to run. So he's not the, we see if this guy's legit or not because 99% of real estate investors, wholesalers, flippers, whatever, they're not going to stay the test of time. And so Roderick uses me as kind of the filter to who should we screw around with and who should we ignore. And 
Well, what I'm trying to say is, first, you should be reaching out to people in your area online all the time because you don't know who you're going to meet that just, you know, people are different. Nate didn't expect me to be the way I am. Just, hey, I'll show up and then, hey, we'll buy some houses from you. Hey, like, we can share resources. We'll share everything that we know, blah, blah, blah. Because, well, like you said, you know, you go there, you make sure he's taking it seriously and then we'll, we're happy to uh, coordinate. And the second half of that is, you know, Roger and I work so well together, not because it's, because he's amazing and I'm amazing so much. It's because we've done 50 deals together over the last um, five years. And there's just, there's a, there's an intrinsic value to the relationship that can't be, it, it, it just, it's built in. And so we can, you can bring Nate and say, Hey, look, you can get the benefits of that. And we'll both teach you. We'll, we'll bring some resources in. Not to say that it's one sided by any means. Like we love, you know, I'm thankful Nate, that Nate showed up. Um, but that goes for other people too, where if you think you're going to show up and it's just going to be some unicorn investor or contractor is going to drop in your lap. It's most likely not the case. What's really the case is you should find somebody who's on their way up with you and you guys grow together. And then you start bringing people in as you increase your legitimacy. But like Nate had, right? He was messy in his first few deals because, and mine too, it's not saying like, I didn't mean right to my fourth deal, my third. Um, and so I went through a bunch of contractors and messy property manager and da, da, da. And so some of that is putting in dues. And, and then some of that is like the people who are doing things, they're not going to screw around with you until you know, you're going to stick around and nobody knows you can tell them all you want, but nobody knows you're going to start until you've eaten a couple of, you've eaten dirt a few times and through a few deals. And so there's people out there that just will not screw with you until you've done five deals, 10 deals. Some people it's like, eh, call me when you have a hundred units, right? Like the players that you just. So all I'm saying is one, Nate, like Nate said, it's a long game. That's why him and I get along so well because we share that. I never play for two years. I always play for 40. And suddenly, you know, it's always a networking thing and it's showing people, you know, I saw, I'm sorry, I'm rambling. I know there's this bit about like, you know, finding mentors about trading value, but I think it's more, it's less about trading value and more that showing people that you're a good investment. And so that Nate shows up and says, Hey, Alex, look, I'm not screwing around. Let's hang out. I'm, I'm the real deal. And I can bring value to you. And I say, yeah, that's, that's, it, it values good, but also, Hey, look, I can spend my time on this guy. It's not wasted time of mine. Not because he's making me money, but because I like to see him succeed. And I know that if I sink, sink some time into him, he will. And so there's somebody who's looking for handouts, not even just, even if you could provide value, if they think that the time that they spend on you is going to be wasted, nobody's going to bother. So Anyway, man, I that's good. Point, like from a coaching perspective, right? If you give somebody, like if someone comes to you to ask for advice, right? They're asking for your time and you give it to them. If you turn around and you execute on that and make it happen, then there's a good chance that that relationship will continue. But if you ask somebody for advice and they give it to you and they give you some pointers and then three months later, you've got a whole bunch of reasons why you didn't accomplish it. They're not going to give you their time ever again. Like that's the reality. And I'm not going to use examples here, but there have been people in my life who have, I've asked for advice or whatever, and then, you know, turn around. And there was a point in my life where somebody, uh, well, in fact, it was Doug, told me like, yeah, the reason that so-and-so still talks to you is because every time that you do, that, they, that you guys meet, you do X, Y, Z. And I had never even thought about it that way until I started kind of coaching people and helping people out. And all of a sudden I'm like, Oh yeah, absolutely. The people who don't listen to anything I say or have excuses for why they didn't do it, like that don't actually take the advice or, you know, like it's whatever. So it's, it's being, yeah, being a good investment and being someone who actually like tries, like it's amazing how much just trying things will, will work for you in life. Oh yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, it's just the same thing. Like, you know, it's, it's, proof of concept for everything you do, right? Like, so I didn't ask for anybody else's money when I flipped my first house. It's like, why, why am I gonna do that? Like, let me get proof of concept. You know, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of nice. You know what I mean? I, I, of course I share it on, on social media and like, you know, stuff like that. And then people are like, oh, what happens if you fail? Uh, I mean, so what I fail, that's the, that's a real part of life is failure. Like social media is what I think is, is a great platform, right? You can share ideas, you can, post pictures, but then there's a good percentage of people that are just faking the funk, right? It's all persona. It's all fake, right? You know, people are like, oh, well, you shouldn't post this on social media. What if it fails? Like, I don't care if it's going to fail. People are going to find out regardless, right? Let me be a fun about it. You know what I'm saying? And, and that kind of, you know, kind of drove a couple of people that I've, you know, that I've known for, for years that I've served with, like a buddy of mine, Jimmy, he, he invested on that uh, townhouse deal, right? He's just like, hey, dude, I'll give you 
I'll give you 50 grand, right? What, what, what can I get? So I said, listen, you give me 50 grand, right? I'll split the deal with you, right? And stuff like that. And that was it. You know, of course, I treated them like any other business, business partner transaction. I sent them receipts, sent them the budget tracker. I sent them, you know, updates. And he was like, oh, dude, you don't have to do that. And then we know each other. I said, nah, I have to do it like this because it's muscle, muscle memory, right? I just got to treat it like a business transaction, you know, stuff like that. And he was like, okay. And, you know, he's getting ready to go back overseas right now. And he's like, hey, listen, you know, after we cashed out on this deal, I was like, do you, do you just want to hold on to the money? He's like, nope, I don't have anything in the pipeline. I said, if I did, I would have paid him out his profit right, and kept his money and rolled into another deal, but I don't have it. You know what I mean? The guy, he's just, he's just one of two investors that I know that are like, that I've known forever. And they're like, listen, we'll invest in you, right? Because we know that you're going to execute what you say you're going to do. And if it doesn't go well, right, that you're going to make sure that we recover our funds first before you pay yourself out. So that's how they know how I am, right? So, and that's yeah. kind of how I'm going to move forward with all the other deals when I get to St. Louis is that, you know, I think I've got enough jelly to where, you know, when I start doing what I'm doing here and, and, you know, in St. Louis that, you know, I can start giving preferred returns and not having to say, okay, I mean, you're going to get 50% of net, you know what I mean? I may have to start off like that a little bit, but I'm not going to give away the whole pie. Um, but again, it's just rebuilding what I've worked here and in Clarksville in another, in another market. Like Alex says, finding contractors and, and people that find you deals. My biggest hinge pin is finding contractors. It's always yeah. going to be that way. I think that's what I'm going to look for first because in St. Louis, I know enough family down there that are all tradesmen. Guys are contractors, but that's what's, that's what's really going to burn you down the road because I can find the deals. I can analyze the deals. I can project manage the deals. I can run the numbers. I need, I need someone over there because I don't want to lay any more tile. I don't want to lay any hardwood. I don't want to paint. I don't want to put up fences. I don't want to do any of that stuff. I can, right? I've done it on every single one of my flips here that I've done some type of rehab portion of it, right? But I don't need to be there all the time because I need to be finding, finding deals, acquisitions. You know, that's the biggest thing that I need to be doing. That's the, where, that's where the most bang for my buck is going to be, right? It's, so, it's good uh, that you recognize the doing the high dollar per hour tasks. It's not scalable to do the work yourself. So I will... Uh, I like your mentality on the, the failure piece, right? Cause it's going to happen. And I totally agree with contractors and, uh, transparency and all that, you know, I mean, for those who heard me mention it earlier, but don't know the full story, like I'm under contract to get rid of a house I was going to flip right now. And I'm going to take a 50% hit, you know, assuming I don't get my money back out of a contractor, but I'm, I'm, I'll be, well, I'm going to sell my appliances back. So I'll be 61,000 in and I'm under contract for 31, nine contractor some some crappy things happen it is what it is fail move on whatever not my not my best deal by any means but it happens right and you know you scroll with a bunch it's like it's not it's gonna stop me it's not gonna stop you like stuff happens so no i mean that's good because you gotta tell people the truth because i like to spread it when we've been at his uh Deseret thing like when people get their first deal and it's a home run the illusion that it's as easy as people make it on TV or social media will skew every other deal after that. Like, like I don't think, you know, I, I think they should definitely learn like, Hey, it's a lot harder than it is. Um, they need to, I, I mean, personally, right. And this is my, the way I think is like, I need, I need to know how to rehab properties. Right. Cause that's what I did. I lived in Clarksville. It was like, I rehab my house, you know, I, I added a, added a mud room, added a den, put the hardware for it. That's just me. Right. I just need to know something about rehab or construction right which which is great because that's going to lead into what i'm going to do in st louis is you know buy into a property management franchise because you know when you study for a real estate course it tells you you know property managers need to know some type of rehab you know while you know codes and stuff like that so it kind of kind of fell out but i think if you don't know what maybe it's just the military mentality right like you don't know what you don't know because you have never done it then how can you expect to supervise or manage people, you know, that are doing these not lower level works, but other tier jobs in order to meet the, uh, the whole objective, right? So if you don't know what people are doing underneath you or who you're managing, how can you be effective to make sure they're doing it right? You're just going on their word, which is great, you know, trust but verify, right? But if you don't know what you don't know, 
you, you can't make sure it's right. So yeah. that's the way I look at it. Don't does overestimate. Alex, yeah. Does, does Alex really still call it Deseret? Yeah, I think that's what he tags it at when he, he does it. Yeah. I mean, I so guess you can't good. you can't take the desert out of the Alex, but you know what? You don't even know the origin of the story. Desert Rat Real Estate started in, in Las Vegas, Nevada, because we met at eight a.m. on a Sunday, and we and it got popular surprisingly. Yeah, in the desert. And they, it's not your. You know what? Stop making assumptions. You don't know. So they said we need a name for this on Facebook just so we can invite people. I said we need a name. I don't have a freaking name. I said you know let me use my call sign from my unit while we were in Afghanistan in 2003. It was, we were Desert Rat 76, because I was a commo guy. That was, our, that was our radio call sign. And I said, oh, we're in the desert, kinda. And uh, nobody else will have that name for certain. And I didn't think it'd grow, so I didn't care. So I just called it Desert Rat, and everyone goes, what's that about? And I tell that little story, I'm like, it's badass, bro. No, I, I like and, that, I'm glad I said something. And so, then, and so then it stuck around, and now I'm back at Fort Bragg where I got that freaking name anyways. It's more appropriate than ever. I don't good. I tell you to do it. Tell you to do it. Uh, I'll tell you off there. <laughs> if if I was to use my call sign for things, it would be the shocker, which is probably not ideal for things. So whatever. No, nobody wants that on a real estate podcast. I know it's tattooed on my chest. Uh, oh Jesus. Yeah. Really? One, one, one of your mistakes that you made as a as a young Marine. I don't I don't consider that a, re- a mistake. I think that's my funniest tattoo I've ever gotten. And it has a lot of meaning. Yeah, to that's me. like that's like the fifty-year-old chick walking around with a tramp stamp. Yeah, like, but uh, I don't. I don't like care. Time. Nobody sees me shirtless unless I'm at a pool, and if that's what they're watching, then hey, good on them. <laughs> More uh, power all right. <laughs> so, if an E1 or E2 was to walk up to you asking for you for advice, Nathan, yeah, just a moment or two to give it to them. What would you tell them to get started? I would tell them, don't go buy a car that you don't need, because that's like the biggest. That's the biggest thing, right? You, you can't you can't talk about anything after that portion, right? Because they're going to need transportation. You know, they're gonna they're gonna buy it. But if if they understand the concept of of hey, don't buy something that you you need a car. I got it, but do you really need that car, right? The smart ones that have ever worked for me directly, like you know, if they can figure that portion out, get a car that works, but not that brand new BMW or that brand new Ford F one fifty, right? Those are usually the ones that, that grasp a little bit of financial understanding, right? And then I tell them about all the dumb shit that I did. Not really dumb, but I just didn't put my money to work faster, right? I never, you know what I mean? Um, so that's usually, I tell them, don't buy that car. Like, you know, that, that's it. If they, if they understand that portion, they can execute that. I think they'll, they'll usually come back for a, a little bit more um, money advice. And then I give them a little bit more, you know, and, but I tell them all the things that I did that was really stupid. Don't do this, right? I want you to be better than me. I want you to be smarter than me. And then, you know, I've given a couple things about the TSP, you know, putting money, doing something, fire and forget it, right? You know, stuff like that. But yeah, if they buy, they buy a car. Like I had a guy in Hawaii buy a BMW. Like literally I picked him up from, repla- from a replacement, you know, when they show up, you know, and then. I'm in Hawaii, so I bought an Island Beater, which is like a 2004, you know, coupe BMW. I paid cash, cash for it, right? You know, they wanted nine. I paid them like six grand. I was like, here you go, six grand in cash in an envelope. Take it or leave it, right? So this, of course, this private sees this, and I'm like, listen, don't get this thing confused, bro. Like, I bought this cash. Like, I'm gonna sell this when I leave the island. I was like, if you want to buy a car, I said, I got no problems. You're gonna get my phone number. I'm gonna be your platoon sergeant anyway. I said, I'll take you on the island to go wherever you want. To go buy a car, right? It's like two weeks, three weeks he's been in the unit. I'm working out in the prison gym, right, at work, and he walks by and I'm like staring at him. I'm like, what did you do this weekend? And he's like, oh, I bought a car. I said, you fucking idiot, are you serious? Who went with you? He started like, I put down the weights, I started grilling him, he was just like, oh shit, right? He's like, oh, I bought this, I bought a BMW. I'm like, you fucking retard, are you serious right now? And long story short, he couldn't afford it. I went, I took him back to the dealership and I literally bluffed the dealership. I'm like, hey, listen, if you, you sold a private, an E2, a BMW, you know, and he can't afford it, I said, either one, you make this right and you fix it, he'll buy a car here at this dealership, right? Or I'm going to go to JAG. I'm going to bring his contract. I'm going to blackball you. I'm going to get you blackball. I said, I'll do whatever it takes right now. Started pulling out my phone, taking videos. Like, 
anything I could just to shake this guy, right? He's like, let me go talk to my manager. I was like, no, 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 I want to, I want to talk to your manager. I want to talk to the guy that owns this dealership. How about that? As I have, like, have my phone out. So they ended up taking the car back, luckily, because I don't know if I could have made that shit work out to try to blackball him because my Joe is an idiot, right? I tell him, you're not retarded. You're doing retarded. No leverage there. That's all bluff. (laughs) <laughs> it's all bluff, right? You know what I mean? You gotta believe in your hype before anybody else does. And that dude believed what I was I was gonna I was gonna go full bore, right? So luckily I, I was able to help him get a car return that BMW and get a car that he can actually afford. Right? So I like it. You know, I helped him out, but yeah. That's good. All right. So what is one resource, a book, course, website, whatever, that you would recommend to anybody getting started as a real estate investor? Uh, I mean, I would just say bigger pockets because there's everything on there because you can see it. You can find it. You can read it. You can look at blogs. You can interact with people, right? I mean, you're going to you're gonna hear everyone tell you, you know, rich dad, poor dad, all that kind of stuff. But like bigger pockets is 100% free resource, right? It's just like, it's, it's really ridiculous. Like when people ask me about it, I tell them like, hey, listen, go to bigger pocket. Just get on there, read some blogs, interact with people you know, kind of surf around and then they'll come back and it's like, okay, I did that. You know, like what else? I was like, get audible. So I tell them like, why? I said, because if people are going to reference books on there. And I said, you know, we're in this fast, fast time right now. You're not going to have enough time to sit down and read. Right. So get audible because you're either driving to work, driving from work, you're doing something, right. You might as well use, use some time. And that's what I do. You know what I mean? So I, just, yeah. I tell them everything I, everything I did. Yep. Yeah, Audible's huge. I'm not cool, though, because Alex got a little email at the end of the year saying, this is how many books you read this year, and I didn't get that shit. So, you got to read more than one, sir. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> my I, my, my uh, promotion report this year was only from, like, July when I checked in to, like, December, and my, my uh, boss, the guy writing it, like, questioned because I run out of space for books and sent him a PDF, like a Word doc. It was like, this is all the books I read in the last six months. And he, like, made me, like, I, I almost had to, like, show, like, no, seriously, like, this is what Here they were is. purchased. And they all say finished. <laughs> like, yep. like, I don't know, just driving to work. But No, I mean, it's, it's great. The that being said, the half of those are probably books that weren't even worth reading. So, you know, you, you read them, you're like, eh, you know, whatever. And then the other half, I'm like, ooh, I'm buying a hard copy of that and reading it again. So, yeah, I don't think I'll uh, get to that portion buying how, a hard copy. That's how books are, though, right? You got to yep. get through like 90% to get the good 10. Most books don't ever need to be written ever. Yeah, like all of Nassim Taleb's books, pfft, trash. <laughs> <laughs> no, some of my some of my best the best books out there. I can't even I can't even hate on Alex's favorite author. Um, they're great. They're great. I'm reading Anti Fragile right now, and it's just as good as the rest. So uh, before we wrap this up, oh nope, yeah, whatever. Is there anything else that you'd like to add? Parting advice, big ideas. Uh, no, uh, network, 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 network. Right. Um, take advantage of it. But again, so I don't network at real meetings very well because I think this. You know, this is probably a reason me and Alex kind of clicked because he asked me why I haven't been to him. I because I don't like the pitch, right? I don't like, there's going to be a pitch somewhere, right? So anybody that I've ever networked with, right? I want to go to their job site. I want to see the projects they're doing. I want to see if they're legit because I'm like, oh yeah, I'm working on this. Come over here and come check the project out. Not just to boast, not to, you know, but I want them to see like, yes, I'm actually doing it. Like going to a meetup, right, is great. Um, but I think again, it's kind of, I don't think it's all facade, but I think there is there is a there is a percentage where it's it's pitchy, right? Um, you can meet someone there, right? And then what happens after that, I think, is really where the real network networking happens, right? It's again the follow up and the execution portion, because I've been to two re- two meetups here, right? Um, and that was it. Like I like it. I, I met some people there. I followed up with them to see what they're doing. And, then, and, that, and then that's kind of it. You know what I mean? But networking is key. Like, get out of kind of your comfort zone. You've got to network, right? But again, like Alex and a bunch of other people say, like, when you meet people, don't ask them, like, oh, hey, can you help me do this? Can you help me do that? Like, maybe you should find some questions about, like, hey, you know, I, I, I heard you say that you did this. How did you tackle that? Like, something that they can answer without having to go too deep, right? And then, you know, 
kind of like uh, the mirroring effect. You know, you, you got to reciprocate what they're saying, but make sure when you ask them a question, it's like they're, you're not giving away trade. You're not making them give away trade secrets. You know what I mean? Yeah. And figure to kind of stir the conversation because they want to talk about themselves, right? But figure a way to stir, you know, get the conversation to where they're going to ask you about something that you're doing, right? And then be ready to prove it. Be ready to show proof of work, you know, stuff like that. And that's, that's pretty much about it because you can tell who the bullshitters are, right? Because they're, they're, they're just, they're just, they're just there. You can just tell. Yeah. Got that bullshit meter all the time. Where, where can people get a hold of you if they want to learn more about you? Uh, on Facebook and Instagram. I mean, I'm on, I'm on there. I, I'm on the, the war war room page. Thanks Dave for getting that done. That's really great for, um, I try to tag as many people as possible that are in the military looking to put money to work, right. Or even thinking about real estate. I just tag them and say, join this because it's all military, right. Back to duty, prior service, whatever the case may be. Yeah. I've um, had some personal friends who weren't military. Right. And it, it is what it is, but I mean, you know, it's kind of the transition, like I'm retiring, right? Like you're always going to have that anchor to the military, regardless what branch of service it is, right? You're going to always have that security blanket or anchor, right? But eventually you're going to have to, you're going to have to move on, but you always want that, you know, that kind of check because everyone's doing, doing other things in the outside world. And I think, you know, most of the people that I network with here in Fort Bragg or either prior service are still in because I've tried to, to deal with, you know, people that have never been in the military and I just, they're, bull, they're, they're bullshit. It's just like, um, in fuego. I'm like, are you sure, man? Like, yeah. you know, they're just not very honest people. So that's probably just around here. Yeah. For, for those who don't know, the War Room Real Estate Mastermind is a, it, it's that, it's just a mastermind group that we put together for military guys to pull together and talk about goals and stuff. So that being said, this guy has to go to work for the next 25 hours. So yay duty on my 30th birthday. Woo! Can't think of a better way to celebrate. Uh, for those of you listening, we appreciate you. And uh, Nathan, thank you very much for joining us today. No, thanks for having me on, man. Appreciate it. Anytime, brother. Have a good one. You too. Thank you for listening to another episode about my journey from military to millionaire. If you liked it, be sure to visit from military to slash podcast to subscribe to future podcasts. While you're there, we'd love for you to rate the show, give us a review on iTunes, now get out there and take action.